something larger. And uh, hopefully uh, I can bring you some uh, useful information from the Division of Labeling Review. Um, because we impact everyone, uh, we seem to hold up approvals quite often. So hopefully we can provide you with some information that will help uh, you um, know what we're looking for, submit it initially, and maybe we can reduce some of these uh, review cycles. Uh, over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give a very brief uh, review of the re uh, uh, overview of the labeling review process, uh, provide responses to questions we often get from industry, and recommend useful strategies to reduce review cycles and provide high quality submissions. So um, to follow on with what Don had mentioned, once the RPMs get the ANDAs and um, pass them along, they come to labeling. We have seven teams. We have seven uh, labeling project managers. And they decide, depending on the product, which team that it will go to. The project managers then assign the labeling uh, portion to a reviewer who evaluates your submission and provides any d deficiencies that um, they might encounter. And then um, once that's done, either the RPM or the LPM, depending on the nature of the deficiencies, are communicated back to you, the applicant. So there's two main ways in DLR that we typically communicate deficiencies. And it's usually um, with the ECD, or the easily correctable deficiency, or with a labeling only um, CR. So once we send out our deficiencies to you, um, a lot of times we're going to get a response. And then there's more deficiencies, and then it continues. So then I guess you wonder, well, why the back and forth with uh, so many times? You know, we've, we've given you our deficiencies. You respond and come back. So why does it take four, five, six cycles to get the review done? Well, there are many reasons. Um, most of confusion. You know, you, you, you don't quite understand what we want. Um, our directions are unclear when we give you our, um, our comments and our deficiencies. Um, there's unasked questions, unanswered questions, conflicting information, which does happen. And I think the last one, new unexplained changes, you'll um, find out in just a couple of slides. So these are questions that we typically get. And so hopefully this will kind of help answer some of them so that you'll know in advance what labeling is looking for. Like which product labeling? should be used as model labeling when the NDA RLD is discontinued. Well, we've learned um, and we're uh, reinforcing more that it's the NDA RLD for labeling purposes. And I think you've heard yesterday about the reference standard and the reference listed drug. That's where this comes in. The reference standard is used for bioequivalence purposes. But whenever we're dealing with labeling, it's the reference listed drug is what we have to compare our labeling to. Um, please note, and this is the new information that you're probably not aware of yet, that um, the content of labeling should be the same as the NDA RLD. However, this also includes the name. And this is something that's a little bit different than what we've done for years. We, if it's a USP monograph, we always use the established name that's in the monograph. That's in the USP. That's been something that we've done over the years. However, to try to streamline our processes so that we're not constantly sending you a deficiency, uh, to please revise to use the name in the reference listed drug, I'm kind of announcing it now. And hopefully, you will know that. And the reason why we're doing that is it, um, it's more consistent. We know that um, generics are you know, pretty much on top of things, and they make changes very quickly. But sometimes the NDA, because it was out there first, has not made this change yet. So a lot of times they were in the marketplace before a monograph was developed. So if, if it's you know, ranitidine SERP, they're not going to change. You know? And we know it's ranitidine oral solution. So we need to communicate more, and we're reaching out to the uh, um, RLD more in order to make that change. Because we want them to make the change to have the monograph title. 
then all the generics can make the change. And therefore, we're more consistent in the marketplace because you'll have some, some will come in and be the same as the RLD, some will use the monograph title, and so there's different names out there. And so we're trying to standardize this and uh, eliminate so much inconsistency in the marketplace. So please bear that in mind. We have started asking people to change, and so we are working with the NDA to make have them change and then everybody can change and we can be consistent. And also this allows um, the NDA if they need to, to make more extensive changes. So we're working very closely with them so that we can all look the same in the marketplace. Okay, second question. Does this also apply for, do, for da safety labeling changes in terms of discontinued products? And I think we discussed this before that yes, it does apply. Um, under, even though it's under um, a, a different authority, under 50504, it's still the same thing. That even if a drug product is discontinued but not withdrawn, they are expected to update their labeling. So um, that is something that is across the board. So we, we're going to email or notify all marketed products that you must update, and that's the expectation. A couple of other things in terms of uh, FADAS safety labeling changes. In the notification letter, there's usually proposed language or changes that they're wanting uh, you to make. If you follow what is asked in the letter, you can submit the changes as a CVE0. However, if you don't agree with the language and want to propose something different, then it has to be done within 30 days and it has to come in with, as a PAS. So that's very important that, that you remember that. Um, which product labeling should be used as model labeling when the NDA RLD is withdrawn? And that's something we're hearing about more now, and I think uh, we heard about it a little bit yesterday. So when a product is withdrawn and it's been uh, published in the Federal Register, things are, ha are, are handled differently because now there's no RLD. It's, it's gone. So there's a couple of guidances. I didn't reference the other one. There's another guidance that tells you what to do when the marketed drug has been withdrawn. But this particular guidance, which they talked about yesterday, I think, with Merica and Martha, um, that talks about the reference listed drug versus the reference standard. Now, that guidance in, in um, footnote 28, I think, addresses specifically things that labeling can do, because I've been asked the question, where do we get the labeling? And we're contacted, where do I get the labeling? You can either get it from FOIA, or you can do control correspondence. But in this footnote, it actually tells you that you can uh, select an ANDA that's out there, that's being marketed, that it has the same RLD as what you're using, and you can submit your submission uh, comparing your labeling to that ANDA. It's not the RLD, it's not necessarily the reference standard, but what, the main thing is you want to get your application in-house, and then we'll handle any issues via the review process. But this is a way for you to get hold of the labeling, because that's usually the question, like where do I get it? So we'll handle it once it gets in, but this is what you can do, and not rely on FOIA or control correspondence. Okay, what labeling should I use uh, for my side by side? Well, if if um, it's new RLD update, you want to compare to the updated labeling. If, however, you're um, submitting revised labeling based on a deficiency that we sent you, then you want to compare to your previously approved labeling because we need to make certain and compare that you've made the changes that we've requested, and make sure that you annotate your side by side well. Um, because there's a lot of times things are different. There's n you know no, nothing that tells us why it's different. That raises questions. That uses up review time. Okay, and what labeling pieces can be submitted in draft? Uh, this this guidance has kind of raised questions about what to do in this situation. Uh, I need you to understand that for draft, which I think came became effect in 2015 that it's the content of labeling. So that's your prescribing information and uh, patient information, 
uh, med guide. Those pieces can be in the, you know, eight and a half by 11 black and white paper. However, when you're talking about your carton and container, it has to represent what it's going to look like in the marketplace. So if you want to call it FPL, if you want to call it printer's proof, however you want to phrase it, we need to see what that's going to actually look like because that labeling piece or those labeling pieces are the ones that contribute most to medication errors. So we want to see that the font is correct, the right size. We want to see that there's color differentiation. So that those uh, labeling pieces, we need to see what it's going to really look like in the marketplace. Okay, let me see if there's anything else. Okay. And so what is the most efficient way to submit the same labeling change to both an NDA and an ANDA when the applicant owns both? And this is a situation where we do have NDAs that have applications uh, in, in OND as well as in OGD. And so they're making the same change to their labeling, so they want to just submit them both at the same time. Well, that's really not very efficient for us because we can't do anything with it because the RLD is not, is not approved. So for efficiency's sake, and, and until October 1st, uh, cost effectiveness, because you, you, know, you have to pay for PSs, it's best to submit the labeling to the NDA, get that approved, and then the ANDA can come in as a CBE zero. Okay? Okay. Who is responsible for the distributor labeling? It's going to be the ANDA holder um, because this is who you've contracted with. So um, you are responsible. Uh, normally you're not contacted until there's a problem and when we get a notification that there's been a medication error or there's a problem then we have to come to you and then the expectation is that you reach out to your distributors to resolve the situation. Uh, if you ever look on Daily Med you see the distributor label in many cases looks nothing like the approved ANDA. So it shouldn't be that way, it should be consistent, it should be using the ANDA as its model but a lot of times that is not the case. Um, you want to make sure that your distributor's uh, information is current on, on the Daily Med website and that when you are submitting a supplement for change of CBE, it is not necessary that you submit uh, representative samples of all of your distributor labels. We don't need that. The only time you can submit a distributor label if it's the subject of your submission. Otherwise, just send in the labeling that um, you are having revised and that we're going to approve. Okay. So who do I contact if I have questions? So uh, don't email me because I get lots of emails and sometimes they just kind of sit there um, because by the time I get to them it's just not timely. So I do encourage you to reach out to the generic drugs mailbox and submit your questions, especially if it's a general question. If it's a specific question regarding a particular ANDA, then you can reach out to the RPM. If it's multidisciplinary, if it's just labeling, you can reach out to the PM, uh, LPM for that particular ANDA. Okay, so recommended strategies um, to go along with the questions I answered that you need to submit text-based uh, PDFs so that, um, you know, not a scanned version because we do use um, search um, uh, software and you can't do it on a scanned document. Again, if you're proposing a trade dress, a different trade dress to your uh, entire product line, contact us at the mailbox and find out if it's okay because then we can determine whether or not you need a PAS or not. Uh, refrain from making unnecessary, unsolicited changes to your labeling, especially when it's close to approval. It's amazing you're ready to sign off and you'll come in with an amendment with something different and then it's something wrong. <laughs> and we have to start over and it's very frustrating for us. We're like, oh, why did they make this change? And so refrain from doing that until after your application is approved and makes it much better. Uh, when you're going to submit an amendment, 
always, and I think Don mentioned this, always check um, uh, drugs at FDA, the Orange Book, USP, to see if there's any updates and make sure that's included in your submission so that saves, um, you know, some time. At the time of approval, labeling must be the same as the approved labeling of the reference list of drug. So this is a situation, you're ready to go, and then two days before approval, the RLD updates its labeling. And then we get the call, we get the email, I have all of this product packaged, I'm ready to go, can we do this as a post-approval change? And most likely, no. Where's to be the same as the RLD before we go for it, so you've got to anticipate this. And if it's a blockbuster drug, you can almost guess a change is going to come late in the game, so kind of plan on this. But we get this all the time, and no, we can't just say, well, okay, we'll wait until post-approval because we're supposed to be the same at time of approval. Okay, and for drug products manufactured in a foreign country, make certain that that's on the labeling. And then when um, uh, submitting uh, labeling or changes to your manufacturing site, if it doesn't include or involve the carton and container, you can do this um, as an annual report. So if it's just something that's going to be in the insert labeling, you can do that annual report. But if it's something that's going to change the trade dress or the appearance of your carton container, you need to submit that as a supplement for us to review. And again, and I think this echoes some of what Don mentioned, the 356H uh, updated. Uh, several points of contact on the 356H in case the one person is gone, we won't get 